team. My name is Erin Barker and I am a customer success specialist with Hypothesis. Today we're talking about actual implementation of social annotation in your courses using Hypothesis. One thing I want to tell you before we get started, today we are not talking about how to add a Hypothesis assignment to your LMS. I'll quickly give you some resources on how to do that. Um, we are also not talking, going to go into a lot of depth into what hypothesis is. The assumption is if you're here, then you kind of have a general idea. That said, we'll do a quick review um, and then we'll hop into actual ideas for use with your students. So first we're going to cover today a quick review of what social annotation is and its benefits. Then we'll do a quick review of how hypothesis works in your LMS. We will not work specifically with the very, like just Canvas or just Sakai or whatever, just because everyone here has different LMSs. We're gonna talk about why social annotation is important. I'm gonna give you some ideas for using social annotation in your courses and with your students. And then I'm gonna give you some specific examples of hypothesis in action. So if you've been to a previous hypothesis workshop in the past, which I actually think is many of you, you know that we like to use a quote uh, about sharing the margins of a reading with our colleagues and peers. So to that end, I wanna go ahead and share this quote from Dr. Brandon Morgan from Central New Mexico um, about social annotation, because I think it really encapsulates, encapsulates, let's see if I can say that correctly, the purpose of social annotation. So take about, five, 10 seconds and read the quote to yourself. I like this because I think this comes directly from an instructor who uses social annotation frequently in his courses. And I like it because it's direct and to the point and it gets to what we want social annotation to do, which is to think critically and engage with text. We also want our students thinking to be visible to us, the instructors. So I heard this wonderful um, liquid margin show recently where the instructor was talking about marginalia representing individual thoughts and individual interactions with the text, but it all lives in the reader's head. So think about social annotation now taking what's living in the reader's head, taking that marginalia and allowing that to be shared with peers and colleagues. Lots of you have seen this slide before, but I wanna just point it out again. Uh, we have lots of resources on using hypothesis in teaching and learning. These are just a few. I always push the annotation etiquette guide for students uh, because I think it's a nice, clear example of creating substantive annotations. And I do like to say, those of you who have been on my webinars before, so I apologize if this is repetitive, I think it would be very meta for students to annotate the annotation etiquette guide. Um, and then adding images, videos, and links to your annotations. This is a great one because think about if your students are able to add images and videos to annotations, they're going to engage um, more deeply with each other and with the text. So real quick, you're here because Hypothesis is installed in your LMS. Uh, whether that's Blackboard or D2L or Canvas or Moodle, just remember that when it's installed in your LMS, students do not need to log in. They automatically have an account with Hypothesis um, and they don't need to be added to the course. They're already in the course and their annotations are private to that course. I do wanna quickly say some of you are coming from schools that are requiring you to add hypothesis at the course level yourselves. I did notice we have a participant here from Ventura College. Is it Valencia or Ventura? Either way, both of them are requiring you to add hypothesis yourselves at the course level. If you have any questions with that, let us know. And this is just a quick list of resources for those of you who may need it on implementing hypothesis specific to your LMS. They're all listed there. If you don't see your LMS listed there, then I probably did something wrong at 11 o'clock at night last night, so. <laughs> so let's get to the meat of what we wanna do today, which is talk about implementing social annotation. 
If you are still on the fence with social annotation or you haven't yet launched a hypothesis enabled reading in your course, I wanted to just go over a few reasons why you might use um, hypothesis and social annotation. We, well, and I just wanna say, we're gonna use a couple different terms here. We'll use digital an annotation, we'll use social annotation, we'll use hypothesis, we'll use marginalia. So the first is that digital annotation really encourages meaning making. Meaning making is the process of how people construe, understand, or make sense, make sense is key, I like that, of life events, relationship, and self. So if students are able to create meaning in the margins of a text and share that meaning with their peers, they're first going to develop a stronger relationship with the text and create stronger connections. And they're going to create stronger relationships with each other because they're able to share that meaning together. I also say that digital annotation encourages textual analysis, which involves understanding the language in the text to gain information um, about how people are making sense of the text, right? If students are really able to engage in deep textual analysis, they can make substantive and deeper connections across context, across readings, across disciplines. And we at Hypothesis really do think that social annotation allows that. Lastly, and I think this is key because you may be the instructor in the room, but you're not really the only expert, right? You're not the only teacher. Um, digital annotation encourages peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, which really allows students to feel socially and emotionally safe, and then therefore prepared to um, learn academically in the course. Think about the comfort level that comes from being able to see each other's ideas, meanings, and connections to the text, and how that then creates a community in a course where students are feel socially and emotionally and academically safe. So a couple other pieces about social annotation and digital annotation that we think are important. Uh, I'm a former middle school teacher. Lots of people are like, yeah, yeah, middle school. How does that apply at you know, the higher ed level? Actually, turns out middle school and higher ed are not so different. <laughs> In middle school, we really focus on this idea of student-centered learning. Um, and in higher ed, we should also be doing the same. And ultimately, learning is the student's responsibility. We think that social annotation shifts the ownership of the learning back over to students, allows you as an instructor to spend less time explicitly telling students what to do, and to spend more time asking them questions. So you can then um, take on the role of provoking their thinking and motivating them to ask their own questions. We also think that it really builds this idea of community around a common critical reading. So again, returning to this idea of you are not learning in isolation. A lot of you might be teaching online right now, you might be teaching in a hybrid format, you might be teaching in person with students who can't come to class because they're in quarantine or for whatever reason right now. Digital annotation allows all of your students to come together over a text and be part of, um, I've, I've said the word community a million times, but be part of a community together. I get a lot of questions right now about how does this work in person? What if we go back to school in person? Now we don't need this, right? Or now we're in a hybrid class, so we meet and you know, we see each other. Or this class is too large to use hypothesis. And actually, I would disagree I think that hypothesis enables student learning in a variety of environments, whatever those look like. If you're online, um, students can go ahead and they can annotate synchronously or asynchronously. If you're in person, you can even take 10 minutes of class out of your in-person class and have them annotate together at the same time, replacing say a discussion. You can also have them annotate prior to an in-person class. If you're in a large class, you can give different students different roles in annotation. Um, and if you're in small groups, you can do the same. Lastly, I think that digital annotation makes your thinking visible to others, um, which leads to more potential change and learning. 
So if you think about this, I, thinking together really leads to cognition across contexts, across groups, across um, diverse ideas. All right, so let's get to some specific ideas or over, you know, cross-discipline ideas for implementing social annotation with students. I wanna be clear here, all of these ideas we have gleaned from instructors across the country and even across the world. So I'm not the expert in the room here. I'm guessing all of you have lots of great ideas as well. And I encourage you to post them in the chat. Uh, the first one is asking students to annotate with questions to the text. So, think, you know, we, we tell students all the time, go ahead and annotate questions about the text. Think about changing that question to, can you annotate with questions to the text? What questions do you have of the text itself? And what kind of conversation does that lead to among your students? Students can annotate with comments and connections to prepare for discussion. So essentially using annotations to promote discussion in class. Some of you have been in my webinars where I've talked about this idea that if you're able to present and vet your ideas um, in writing first, you're more likely to discuss it in class and to have a more substantive discussion in class. So using annotations to actually prepare for in-class discussion. I have a lot of instructors who will go ahead and annotate um, the text prior to students accessing the text. And they go in and they annotate targeted questions to students in the sidebar themselves. Students are able to see the text, they're able to see the questions that connect directly to the text, um, and they don't have to kind of go back and forth between, okay, reading questions, text, how are they connected, what's going on here? When students are able to answer the questions, they can also respond to each other in that sidebar and connect it back to the text. This last one I really like, um, I have some instructors who will provide examples of annotations of a difficult text in advance. So they will show, they're kind of showing students how to create good annotations and how to use that marginalia to their benefit. Um, thinking about how do we take notes on a text? And we don't, you know, this kind of comes into the scheme of, scheme of modeling. The more we model to our students, the better results we're going to get, right? Uh, so they're just modeling those annotations. So I want to stop for a second and take a look at the chat. I see some great comments and questions happening. And let me open up my chat bigger because there's so much going on. So Anna, we have lots of how-to webinars. Um, I can't remember what school you're at, so I can't remember if you have a webinar coming up, but we'll happy be happy to direct you to the right spot. If not, you are welcome to schedule with one of us, either Becky or I, on how to use Hypothesis within your LMS. Ben, I, ben referred to this idea of using Hypothesis um, to teach students how to read in their specific discipline. This is actually one of my favorite ideas. I have lots of instructors who go in and will say, you know, like, this is what you should be paying attention to, pay, uh, focus on these keywords. Um, and this is what you should not be paying attention to. Really helping them guide them through these difficult texts. I love, Ben, I, I can tell you that's one of our most successful uses of social annotation. Carol, regarding um, access to the annotation, students can print to PDF their annotations. Um, and then you, this is kind of getting into the weeds a bit. Um, as an instructor, you can have access to kind of a spreadsheet of all your course annotations and you could print them out for students. Uh, get in touch with one of us. Um, our email is success at hypothesis.is. It's in the slide deck and we can give you access to that dashboard. Erin, I love this. Um, I've taught a reading with or without hypothesis and I didn't get questions until I used hypothesis. Excellent. That's really cool to hear. I hear that quite a bit actually. Um, and Anna at CUNY Kingsborough, we are actually doing a webinar on Wednesday. Um, Emily Schnee is 
the person who's in charge. So if you want to get in contact with Emily, she can give you the information. Or if you want to email one of us, I will make sure to get you that Zoom link. The chat is saved along with the recording, and I believe you get access to that right after today's session. Okay, perfect. I know, Anna, it's like a crazy time. So let's talk about examples of hypothesis in action. I wanna be clear that maybe some of what you see will be from a different LMS than the one that you use, uh, but the idea is the same. The other thing I'm gonna tell you is everything that has a resource is linked in the deck. Uh, so I'll show you an example. This resource about teaching students about annotation, um, this top title right here is a direct link to more information. So just know that if you're like, ah, this doesn't give me enough info, you can go ahead and access the slide deck and select the title and you'll be able to get more about it. All right, or more resources about it. So this is an example of an instructor who really wanted to make sure students knew how to annotate first. She was very intentional with teaching her students how to annotate before she said to them, just go annotate. Good luck with that. Let me know how it goes, right? And so she created these instructions for students on how to use hypothesis specifically and then how to annotate effectively. I love this because I think that this instructor was very intentional and I think that intent is crucial so that students can do the job correctly and demonstrate their learning, which is what you wanna see, right? Uh, so this instructor gave different ways to annotate and then how to annotate effectively and linked the different types of annotations and the tips directly in the instructions. I have seen other instructors who will, if like say they're in an online course or even an in-person course, they will model annotating in front of their students so they know exactly how to do it. This is another example of using explicit instructions. One of the biggest questions, or biggest, that's not correct, one of the most frequent questions I get from instructors is what should you tell students to do? How do you get them to annotate? Um, I think that you have to decide, number one, what is your intent for annotating or for asking your students to annotate together? And you might hear the word intent out of my mouth like a million more times today. That's fine. <laughs> what is your intent? Do you want them to demonstrate their thinking? Do you want them to ask questions of the text? Do you want them to just show that they've read the text? So once you've determined your intent, then you can determine your specific instructions. In this case, you can see that the instructor asked students to choose a word they, they would not normally use and then to annotate that word. Um, and it's possible that in this case, the instructor was trying to get students to focus on vocabulary. That was the intent. You'll notice as well that this instructor asked students to tag their annotations. You can use tags in annotations as a way to categorize or group them um, and to get students to think kind of in this idea of, okay, these are based on theme, these are based on thesis, all, or this is a discussion type of uh, tag. I actually had a criminal justice professor I worked with who had students tag with the type of evidence they found in the text. So they tagged with things like, uh, I believe it was statistic, personal story, physical evidence. This is an example of giving students explicit instructions for reading a scholarly article. And this, again, is linked. If you select the title here, it's a link to uh, more information with the resource. So this instructor said, create two annotations that provide facts or images and one that adds an insight or asks a question. So the instructor is saying, I want three annotations um, and two of them need to be this and one of them need to be this. Again, very specific. And then when the instructor goes to grade, they're able to say, check, 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 you got it right. You check the boxes, you get 10 out of 10. 
I stole this one from my colleague Becky who actually stole this one from another instructor. And again, this is linked directly in the deck. We often talk about using social annotation to create community. So this is a nice way to use social annotation to get to know peers in your class and to feel comfortable working with your peers. I think it also gives more insight into student backgrounds uh, because it's talking about student names. The other thing I was thinking about when I put this together, um, I don't know if some of you have noticed, but our LMSs collect the student name that comes to us from the student information system. And it's possible that is not the name the student prefers. Um, hypothesis itself reads the name sent to us from the LMS. Um, so I think this is a great way to get students to really reveal more about themselves, more about their history and to connect with each other while also learning about annotation. In this case, they had the students annotate their name, uh, give some background on their name. Oops, sorry. Talk about any problems that their name may have caused in the past. Let me go back here. Um, and if they have a nickname. I know that this is not necessarily a scholarly article or an academic activity, but knowing the way brain science works, uh, if we cannot get our students to feel comfortable in our course, they can't learn, right? Oh, Kaisha, I love that. The great way to share preferred pronouns as well. This one does not have a resource, but I want it's something I want to think about and to refer to. I worked with an instructor recently who was really talking about this idea of annotation as recursive practice. Recursive practice, I have to say that correctly. Learning doesn't just end one day, right? In, like, yes, class may end on December 1st and we are done with that course for the term. Okay, fine, goodbye. Ideally, our students do not walk away from our course and stop learning entirely. They're done, right? The same is true of annotations. Um, annotating a text with hypothesis should not be a one-time gig. You should come back to the text over and over again so that you can see how others have annotated. You can go back and check your own annotations. You can see how responses um, are going. So one of the things that we do have to say in hypothesis is that you will have to encourage students to return to annotation regularly. Um, in your LMS, we do not send notifications to students when someone has responded to their annotation. Uh, that's because we don't have access to student email addresses, so we don't have the ability to do that. Additionally, it's because most LMSs are pedagogically built on this idea that if you submit an assignment, you are done. You don't need to come back to it. And in reality, hypothesis is not that way at all. This is another way um, in terms of determining intent and how you would like to grade your annotations. I know that if you're on a smaller screen than me, this text shows up quite small and you can't really see it. So I understand that. Uh, know that this title at the top, Use Rubrics, has a link to this rubric specifically. So feel free to take a look at this rubric. This is a pretty involved rubric for grading annotations, um, but it, some of it may work for you, some of it may not. Feel free to grab what works and what doesn't. Uh, so take a look here. I like some of the um, sections here. Consistency of comment. Depth of consideration. This is one of my favorite topics. Is there a depth of consideration? And how would we grade students on that? And then engaging with other students, I think is really important. Um, I think, ja, was it Jocelyn, Deborah, Erin? Erin, this might help with some of the repetitive piece. I have some other ideas to help you with that as well. I do want to kind of talk about grading and using rubrics and giving students points for annotation assignments. I'm going to give you my personal opinion here and you are free to discard it or listen to it or whatever. I do not think that social annotation is great for assessment purposes. 
I think that it's nice, it's good to demonstrate the process of learning. And in that regard, I think it's better as a participation grade. So you're not necessarily looking for proficiency, you're looking for did students complete what I asked them to do? Um, did they follow my guidelines? Um, and if so, 10 out of 10. Now you may think differently and that is totally fair, uh, but just considering the nature of social annotation and what it's meant to do, if we go back to the first couple slides we talked about, it's not perfect for assessment. Um, I do wanna take a look at some of the questions in the chat. In terms of repetitiveness of annotations, there are some ways around that. I'm gonna throw some ideas out there, um, Aaron, but know that they may work for you and they may not. So the first idea that we often give to instructors is to give students different roles in the annotations. So for example, you might say students with the last names A through F, your job is to create questions to the text in the annotations. Students with last names G through O or whatever, your job is to answer your peers' questions. You may also say students A through F, your job is to annotate with comments or connections pages one through five and students G through Z, your job is to annotate with connections and comments on pages six through 10. So splitting up the document and then giving them different roles within that document. Of course, it does require a little more work on your part in terms of giving the instructions, but I think you'll get less repetitiveness that way as well. You can also divide students into groups and say, hey, group A, your job is to find the key words in this document and define them in the annotations. Group B, your job is to find the key ideas or write questions in the, and write that in the annotations. That might help with repetitiveness. And then if you require students to reply to each other, then um, they're replying to questions or comments they haven't already created themselves. Hopefully that's helpful, I'm not sure, but. Um, yes, I like that. Thank you, Becky, for contributing. One thing about students accessing the text after the course is over, Deborah, is as long as students have access to the course, they have access to the document and the annotations. Uh, so sometimes the school will continue to provide access to the course, but students cannot continue to contribute or to turn in things. Um, they'll still have access to that document and to the annotations that way. Anna, great question. What do you mean by annotate with connections? So you might say to students, I'd like you to annotate with connections to previous readings. How does this reading relate to the reading from last week? Or can you annotate with a personal experience? Tell me how this relates to a personal experience. Can you annotate with something you learned in a previous course? How does that relate? Can you find something else on the internet that is connected to this statement? So those are some ideas with connections. Remembering you can always annotate with images, GIFs, memes, videos, URLs. Um, and so you can even ask students, can you annotate with a related image? adding some visual to the text. So real quick, those of you who've been with me before, you know this, we have lots of Hypothesis partners. Thank you for being our partner. Um, we have over 251 now, which is pretty amazing. I see lots of great questions today, some of them about you know installing or accessing feel free to always, always, always submit a support ticket to support at hypothesis.is. As a partner, your ticket goes to the top of the queue. I will tell you our support team will even hop onto a Zoom call with you if needed and screen share as much as possible. And then if you wanna to talk to Becky or I, this link right here will schedule time with Becky or I and we can walk you through anything you might need with Hypothesis. Lots of the ideas that we use today actually came from Liquid Margins, which is our regular show on using social annotation in dis across disciplines. If you take a look at that Liquid Margins link, um, it gives you access to previous shows where we talk to instructors in world languages and teacher education, 
and they even have little one minute clips with the best ideas. Please check those out because I tell you, I learned so much from that show um, that I then pass off to all of you. And if you have any questions or need anything after today, this is our email address. But before I sign off, I want to see if there's other ideas that might come out from those of you who've been using Hypothesis or more questions. And if you want to talk, you can feel free to raise your hand and um, I'll give you permission to talk. Hi, Kaija. Hi, so it's Kaya, but Hi, there's I'm no, sorry. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, so today actually, so I had my students annotate over the like, over the weekend um, before their Tuesday class. And so then I read their annotations before class and I was able to pick up on where there was a lot of energy, things that people wanted to talk about and some questions that were raised. So then I sort of pick and picked and choose between that about what I wanted to focus on on class. And um, discussion went much better because I was asking questions that connected to what they cared about rather than what I cared about. I mean, it was like, it was related. I picked the things that I cared about out of what they cared about, um, but it was a place where we crossed, right? Our, our interest intersected and it made for a much better discussion in, the cl in class. I love that because I think that, you know, one of the things we always say a hypothesis is that it makes reading visible to you, the instructor. Mm -hmm. And you don't know unless they've taken some notes or annotated it ahead of time. Thank exactly. you. That's, yeah. Thank you for um, contributing that. I love it. Yeah. And for being a good example of what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Kaya is welcome. She will answer all of your questions from here on out. So if anyone has questions, Kaya is here as our special guest. <laughs> Questions, comments, contributions. Joanne, I have my own theories on this one. Um, Joanne asked, how does hypothesis help enhance equity in the classroom? I actually wanna throw this back out there to some of you who may have used hypothesis. How do you all think hypothesis helps enhance equity in the classroom? Okay, so great comments coming in. Uh, I appreciate what you're all contributing right now. So more voices are heard in annotations than in the classroom. One of the free things I frequently say is not all of our students like to talk just because I work in customer success and talk all day doesn't mean others want to. <laughs> so um, they're able to make their voice heard through annotations versus verbal discussion. Students who process differently or more slowly have time to think before they participate. Um, and they have agency. Students can choose what to ask, what to notice, and who to reply to. I love that. So I do want to address this issue with the phones and the equity piece. Hypothesis does work on phones. Um, it will open in the browser window within the student's phone. If you have set the assignment as um, open in a new window in your LMS. Now, some LMSs require you to do that. Some do it automatically. So all a student would have to do is access the LMS app on their phone, click on the hypothesis assignment and will open up. Now, one thing I will be completely transparent and honest about is that if the phone is small, as you can imagine, you have the reading and the annotations. So that's a lot of information to put in a small space. Of course, because it's a phone, you can you know expand it with your fingers, um, but it's a little bit harder to manipulate. I've worked with lots of people who use iPads with hypothesis and have no problem. The other issue is because it opens in a browser, then whatever browser they're using needs to be um, a standard browser, such as Safari or Chrome or whatever it is, and it needs to be up to date. So that's the phone discussion there. I get that quite a bit because we have lots of students right now who are lacking devices and are accessing their work on their phones. Uh, great comments in the chat. Philip, thanks for contributing this. Introverts get a bigger voice. Extroverts can sometimes take over in class. Yes. Um, introverts need more ways to get their voices heard. I would agree. I often in class um, have sat there in graduate and undergraduate classes afraid to say something um, because maybe it's a class where I don't feel 100% confident in all the time. And if I had had the chance to annotate instead of speak it in front of my peers, uh, then my contribution at least gets in there and gets heard. Thanks, Anne, for coming. 
Um, I like the varied and valid perspectives. Thank you, Carol, for that one. Um, and I, I like the idea about appreciate hearing ideas that they not thought about before. So we, you know, we're instructors and we're the experts in the room, but our students can also learn quite a bit from each other. And I think it gives that opportunity. And Erin had a question, does anyone else limit the number of annotations per students, per student, excuse me, Erin. Uh, so if anyone's able to comment on that, that would be great. And Erin, I think by limiting, you're, you're thinking of this idea of don't, don't contribute more than two annotations. Yeah, I actually, um, and Cecilia asked why limit. I wonder if the idea of limiting two is really to get students to think more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To think, yeah, to focus on quality, not quantity, and to to really consider the annotations they're creating. I want it does make me think, Aaron, too. Like, if you can identify those particular students, then if you could reach out to those particular students and say, you only get to create four annotations or whatever that looks like, because there's, you know, not all students are going to contribute fifteen annotations first. It's like this subset of your class, they're always the same ones. <laughs> and Cecilia made a comment about providing a rubric instead of limiting participation that might work as well. Anna, regarding breaking the class into groups through the LMS, uh, right now LMSs do not allow um, students to submit assignments using an external tool like Hypothesis within a small group. We have a workaround uh, that Becky can link in the chat on how you can use Hypothesis with small groups. And coincidentally, we have a webinar on Thursday on using Hypothesis with small groups in your courses. And you can find that webinar and register for it by checking out the Partner Workshops link in the slide deck. And that is when we are going to address the small groups. Thank you to everyone. And Ben, it's good to see you. All right, I don't see more questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. Joe, if you need anything, let us know. Have a great day, everyone.